most <laughs> stirring, beautiful, wonderful collection of um, Resurrection Sunday songs I've ever heard all together. I think they, they're just unbelievable. It's like you just want to say, hey, let's just sing them again all the way through, front to the end, you know. Uh, I hope that uh, you guys are being as blessed there as you watch this afternoon as I know many of us were at being here this morning. And uh, hopefully uh, that's going to change as we said earlier and, and uh, we're going to be able to gather together uh, again here soon. I, I have to say that I am really, really blessed to bring the Word of God to you this Resurrection Sunday. Uh, most messages that uh, preachers teach come from uh, the Gospels for an Easter service and that would be expected. But I'd like to go a little bit different this morning and um, bring some uh, resurrection truths to you from the writings of Paul and Peter. So uh, I will be doing that. Now normally I ask you to follow in your Bibles uh, to the verses that I'm reading from and that's easy for you to do because uh, typically my messages are one verse after another and you don't have to trace all over, chase all over the Bible to, to find the verses I'm using. But uh, because of the message that it is today, it's a topical message and I'm going to be in several different places. So I'm going to ask you if you would to just sit back and relax and listen to the words as I read them. I'll be reading from the New American Standard and um, uh, that way you will not be distracted from the teaching as you try to go to one verse to another and, uh, and you're, you're concentrating on trying to get to that verse and then lose what's being said. So I think it will be better for us and then uh, next Sunday we'll back, be back to asking you to follow verse by verse uh, in your Bible. I'm going to begin this morning with Romans chapter 1, uh, verse 4. And there Paul says, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead. And we've been singing this morning about him being the Son of God. Uh, clearly in the context here, the who is Jesus. So Paul is saying it is the resurrection of Jesus from the dead that declares him to be the Son of God. Now the Greek word translated declare is a very uh, powerful word here. It means to characterize with precision or to set forth distinctively. Or it could be said it is an unmistakable exactness. So the resurrection of Jesus from the dead shows Jesus to be the Son of God with unmistakable exactness, according to the Apostle Paul by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thus, with this unmistakable exactness, Jesus is the Son of God. Now, what is the significance of Jesus being the Son of God? Well, John 5, 18 gives us one of the answers for that. It says, for this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, now listen to this part, but also was calling himself, uh, uh, excuse me, was calling God his father. Let me get that straight. But also was calling God his father, making himself equal with God. So, what they're saying that Jesus then is the Son of God, and that means that, that God then is the Father of Jesus. And the Jews believe, according to this verse, that that made Jesus equal with God, thus making Jesus God. And so we see the resurrection of Jesus from the dead uh, proclaims and pronounces with uh, uh, unmistakable exactness that Jesus is God. Therefore, we have one of the first uh, uh, confirmations or one of the first affirmations of Jesus uh, was the fact that Jesus is Lord. And we know the power of that because of Romans chapter 10 that says, if we will confess with our mouth 
that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God hath raised him from the dead, we shall be saved. So this we see is the power of God uh, for salvation in the fact that uh, the resurrection pronounces Jesus as God. Now, second, I want us to look at Romans chapter 6, verses 3 through 5. This says, For you do not know uh, <clears throat> that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death. Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. Now listen to this part. For if we have become united with Him in the likeness of His death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of His resurrection. Here Paul is making it clear that the born-again believer when they're water baptized, they're baptized into Christ's death. And they have uh, then been baptized into Christ, into Christ's death. Now when the believer uh, goes under the water in the ordinance of baptism, they are being buried with Christ through baptism into death. Now, this is causing the believer to become united with Christ in the likeness of his death. And then it goes on to say, those who have been united with him in the likeness of his death in this manner will also be re resurrected with him in the same likeness. So it's a powerful teaching here that, that as we have been united with him in his death, we will also be united with him in the likeness of his resurrection. As the believer comes up out of the water in the ordinance of baptism, this signifies our rising to walk in newness of life in Christ. Now, that walk is to be by a new ethical code. The Christian is to walk out the new ethical code by the power of the Holy Spirit between the time of their faith in Christ and their following him in obedience in baptism until the resurrection that they will experience in the future. So we see that we are now in that period of time that because we are Christians, because we have faith in Christ, because we've been born again, because we have the Holy Spirit, we can now walk out a life that is totally different from the life we lived before. Uh, uh, Colette was making mention of that earlier in the fact of, of the difference in our life. And all of us recognize that. And that is possible simply because of the resurrection of Christ and, and what has taken place in our lives as believers to enable us to walk out then by the power of the Holy Spirit, that new uh, ethical code that we walk in. This resurrection from the dead in the future is promised to all who have been united with Christ in the likeness of his death through faith and baptism in the past. Thus, we have been united with him in the likeness of his death, and we will be united with him in the likeness of his resurrection. Since Christ has been raised from the dead and given a new resurrection body, all those who have been baptized into his death shall also be raised from the dead and given new resurrection bodies. You say, well, when is this going to happen? Well, it's going to happen at the rapture of the church. The time is coming and the time is soon when Jesus is going to appear in the clouds and he is going to resurrect everyone who has died with faith in him. When they died as a Christian, their spirit went to be with him in paradise. Their body went to the grave or wherever they were buried or however they were buried, and uh, their body remains there. But the day is coming when that body is going to be resurrected and reunited with its spirit, and it will be a resurrection body just like that of Jesus. And all those who are alive when Jesus comes in the rapture 
we will be changed in the twinkling of an eye and we will receive resurrection bodies and together we will be caught up into the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and so shall we always be with the Lord. And that is something that we're expecting at any time. And people might say, well, look how long it's been. Christians for 2,000 years almost have been expecting the return of Jesus at any time. That's true, and they were supposed to be. The resurrection is to be, our, our resurrection or the rapture is to be an imminent thing that we expect at any moment. And that's the proper way for the Christian to live. But look at the fact of where we are to na now, where people were not just a few years ago. And that is the fact that, that the, the Jews have been brought back to Islam. That changes everything. And that was what, 72 years ago? I think it's the right number. And so that is saying to us how much closer we are to the rapture of the church now than any generation of Christians have ever thought about being. And look at what we have going on. Look at our little worldwide pandemic. A little foretaste of that day after the rapture in the first part of the tribulation that one third of the people on the earth will die. This is the kind of proportion of things that God is trying to begin to get our attention and, and show us of. Some have said that there will be one third of the population that will, of the world that will be affected by the coronavirus. Not that one third will die, but there will in some way be affected by it. And to me, that's a real forerunner of, of what's going to happen in the tribulation. But praise God, I believe the scripture teaches that there is a pre-tribulation rapture of the Christian. That our resurrection that we're talking about, our resurrection to a resurrection body like that of Christ will happen prior to the first three and a half years of the tribulation. But I'm saying that this is the time in which we will experience this resurrection. And we need to be looking for it and if you're looking for it and anticipating it every day, then you're going to get a reward just for that in heaven. A crown will be yours because of that. That How can you beat a deal like that? That's, that's amazing. Okay, let's go on now. Let's look at what Peter has to say. 1 Peter chapter 1, in verses 3 through 5, Peter says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Here Peter reveals three important spiritual uh, truths and thoughts uh, and things that are made available to us because of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. The first is this. Lost man can be born again because of the resurrection of Jesus. Man's sin has caused him to be uh, come dead spiritually because of our sin, we become spiritually dead and separated from God. Now, as a result of the resurrection, uh, we can turn from sin and we can be born again spiritually through faith in Christ. Because Jesus is alive, he can offer this new life to us. Had Jesus not been resurrected from the dead, he would have nothing to offer us. There would be no new life to offer. There would be no forgiveness of sin to offer. There would be no eternity to spend in heaven with him. None of this would be available to the Christian if it were not for the resurrection of Christ. We think about his death on the cross and what he endured and, and the powerful thing that that is and the fact that we just sing about it a while ago that God would send his son to do that. 
But all of that, had not it been for the resurrection, would have been for naught. But because of the resurrection of Christ from the dead, every promise that God has ever made is yes and amen in Christ. Now, secondly, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, the believer can obtain an inheritance. Now, you know when you think about obtaining an inheritance, that's pretty exciting. Now, we're not excited that someone is going to die to enable us to have an inheritance because that's, that's what has to happen. Uh, a person has to die for someone to receive an inheritance. But nevertheless, if they have died, it is exciting to think that they have left an inheritance. And uh, we think about that here on earth because someone leaves us a house or a car or uh, a bank with bank account with some money in it or whatever it might be that's a great thing as an inheritance. But think about the difference between an inheritance we would be excited about here and thankful to receive as compared to the inheritance we're going to receive throughout all eternity because Jesus died for our sins and is giving us an inheritance. Peter describes it in four ways. First, he says, it is imperishable, meaning it will never decay. You know, I, I like to watch these uh, uh, shows that rebuild old cars and trucks. And uh, they'll show those things that have holes in them you can stick your fist through because they've rusted. They've decayed. They were beautiful and shiny at one time, but they were imperishable. And, and, and they decayed. They rusted. But they cut those holes out. They filled that stuff with new metal. And they do all of that body work. And they paint those things. And they're actually more beautiful and in better shape than they were when they were brand new. Better paint job when it, than when it came from the factory. All of that stuff. But the point is, the things we have here decay. They rust. They're, they're perishable. But the things that we're going to inherit because of Christ's resurrection and our, and our repentance and faith in Him are things that will never decay. They will never perish. They're imperishable. Second, they're undefiled, meaning they will never become polluted. They will never become corrupted. They will always be pure. There's so many things in our world that's impure today that has started out good and become corrupted. But there's a day in which we will live in a place and in, in a, a, an atmosphere around us that it is always totally 100% pure. For third, it will not fade away, meaning it will not wither and it will not die. We, we buy roses for the women we love, the, the woman we love, excuse me, I meant that in terms of men buying roses for women, <laughs> not me buying roses for women. <laughs> me buying roses for one woman. <laughs> Praise God for that. <laughs> anyway, you know what I mean? But they fade away, you know? Uh, sometimes you can get some good ones. You, you never know, you know, when you're buying them. Boy, they can all look good, and then you get them home and in two days they're gone. But sometimes they'll last a week or whatever. Sometimes a week and a half. But even how beautiful they are, they fade away. And, and there's some, there's one day that no matter how lovely they were, no matter how much they were appreciated, that uh, person uh, you gave them to, they're gonna pull them out of that uh, vase, vase they were, uh, put in and throw them in the trash because they've withered. Okay? But what we have as an inheritance, none of it is ever going to wither and fade away. Now, the next part, number four, this is exciting. It is reserved in heaven for us. It is reserved in heaven uh, for us, meaning that Jesus has already set aside our inheritance in heaven for us. He is holding a place in heaven 
for those who have been born again through repentance and faith in Him. Now that's a powerful word. We are already, as Christians, seated in Christ in the heavenly places. We're hidden in Christ, in God, already. So, spiritually, we're already in heaven. But we don't experience the fullness of that as yet. Uh, but the point is this. There's going to be a day in which we actually receive all of that that is already set aside for us in heaven. It is there, prepared, ready, and waiting for us to go and enjoy throughout all eternity. Number three, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, victory over the devil has been won. That was also being sung this morning. I, I, I just wish I could have remembered every verse or phrase that was in the songs this morning that we're seeing in the truths of the scripture that we're seeing today. But one of those was the fact that we have won victory over the devil, resulting in the believer being protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation to be revealed in the last time. Now, the Greek word translated protected here, it means to be guarded, to keep in a settled state, or being kept secure. So as believers, we must realize that we are not able to keep ourselves through faith unto a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. You and I can't keep ourselves. You say, but we're Christians. We can keep ourselves. No, we can't. We can't keep ourselves saved any more than we can get ourselves saved. Our being saved was an act of God. Had God not intervened, we would have never been saved. And the same truth is there. Had, if it were not for God and His powerful intervention, none of us would remain saved. And so we cannot maintain that ourselves. However, we don't need to be concerned about that at all. Why? Because the believer, listen to this, is kept, the believer is guarded, the believer is protected by what? By the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. It is by the power of God we've been saved and it is by the power of God that we will be kept and it is by the power of God that each of us as believers are going to wake up someday in the absolute 100% full realization of heaven and all that it means. In the presence of God and all that that means. We, we have this understanding that the scripture has given us, but it is so limited. Not that the scripture is limited, but our understanding of it is limited. But there's a day coming we'll, in which we will be limited in no fashion. We will stand face to face to Jesus in all of his glory and everything that he died to give us will be ours 100% delivered to us and it will be ours forever and we can't even imagine forever but think about it. 10 million years 10 billion years 10 trillion years and whatever could come after a trillion I don't know but it doesn't matter what the name of the number would be. It will never end because Jesus has been resurrected. All of that is made available to us. Now in summary, the resurrection of Jesus from the dead proclaims that Jesus is God. If Jesus had not been God, his death would have never been any, of any purpose. If your Jesus is not God, then that Jesus can't do anything for you. 
It's only Jesus who is God that has the power to do anything for us. Second, since Christ has been raised from the dead and given a new resurrection body, all who have been baptized into his death shall also be raised from the dead and given a new resurrection body just like that of Christ. Third, lost men can be born again because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. I said earlier, Jesus going to the cross was wonderful. But had it not been for the resurrection, his work on the cross would have never benefited us anything. He had to die, yes, but he had to be raised from the dead to give to us that which he earned for us on the cross, and that is forgiveness of sin to everyone who will turn from sin and believe in him. Fourth, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the believer can obtain an inheritance. It is imperishable, undefiled, unfading, and reserved in heaven right now for everyone who has a born-again relationship with Jesus Christ. And fifth, because of the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, the believer is guarded, protected, and kept by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. I want to close with two questions. One is, have you accepted Christ as your Savior and Lord? Second, have you been buried with Christ through water baptism into His death? If your answer is no to one or both of those questions, then I encourage you to do what is necessary so that you can have a yes answer for both of those. If you need prayer, if you need counsel, uh, I would encourage you to get together with anyone from our ministry team, our leadership team, someone that you trust and have confidence in within the church, Belita, myself, whoever it might be. But get together with them Get the counsel you need, get the understanding you need, and pray and accept Christ as your Lord and Savior if that's your need. If you've accepted Christ but you've never been water baptized, then you need to uh, let me know about that. We can set up uh, a baptism at uh, Robert and Lee's or later on in the summer in the winter, I mean in the river. <laughs> I was thinking about not doing it in the winter. But uh, we can do that. And uh, it's something that you need to do. Uh, and you see the importance this morning of that uh, water baptiz baptism, as the scripture has pointed out, that that is that uh, coming into the uh, identification with the death of Christ and burial with him. And then coming into that identification uh, of his resurrection and our resurrection as we come up from the water to walk in a new life in him. So I would encourage you to uh, take the steps necessary uh, to be made right with God in those areas if you're not already. Now, I want to say a special thanks to all who have been sending in their tithes and offerings. Uh, you have been being faithful even though you've not been coming to church. Uh, and it's enabling us to continue the ministry of our church in every way except the gathering together, uh, which we're all missing. But everything else is, is going on as it should. Uh, we're still able to fund the eight different mission causes that we're giving to, and uh, the benevolent fund within the church, we're still able to pay the bills, even though a strange thing happened this last week. Um, I usually mail the check-in uh, for the rent around the 20th of the month. It's due on the 1st. 
so I, I, I give it plenty of time to get there. I uh, don't want any late fee or anything like that, but um, this month on the 9th, which was a couple of days ago, we got word from the uh, property manager that he'd not received our, our check for the rent. And um, we went back and uh, I looked in the checkbook and believe I looked at, at uh, what uh, record we had. And I'd written it on the 18th or the 17th and I mailed it on the 20th, and uh, it was the 9th of the month, and he still hadn't gotten it. But he knew how we'd been paying regularly and faithfully, so he didn't charge us any late charge or anything, but uh, we sent in another another check, and uh, we don't know if we'll ever even find the other one or what will ever come from it. Uh, but I'm saying all that to simply say, we were able to send the first one in, and we were able to send the second one in, because you've been faithful in giving uh, your tithes and offerings. And, uh, and the, the mission uh, things that we're supporting now, they are more than ever in need of uh, our regular giving. Uh, so thank you for uh, being faithful so we can continue to do that. Uh, if you do not know uh, the address uh, and would like to send your tithes and offering in, then grab a pen and pencil and I'll, I'll give it to you. Or you can just use your uh, directory and you can find uh, I believe this is my address in here but if you're ready I'll, I'll give it to you a couple of times uh, Common Ground Biker Church or CGBC 339 North Baldy B-A-L-D-Y Place Star Idaho 83669 once again Common Ground Biker Church or CGBC 339 North Baldy Place Star Idaho 83669. Okay, so uh, hopefully everyone has that that wants to uh, send their, their offering in in that manner. Now, as we talk about funding uh, ministries, let me give you a little bit of an update on uh, Nicole and the orphanage in Haiti and the events there. Uh, Nicole was here, as you know, back. Uh, a few weeks ago and uh, <clears throat> when she went back to Haiti uh, she got back just two days before all flights into Haiti was canceled so uh, she was very thankful for that and uh, she spent a quarantine time in Port-au-Prince because of the exposure to the virus here uh, and didn't go to the orphanage until she uh, had gone through that quarantine period and knew that she was healthy. Uh, she has gone to the orphanage and uh, of course they're quarantining everyone there, uh, not going to school and, and all of that. And uh, right now none of them are sick. Uh, one of the uh, men there, his name is Hans, uh, he has been staying away from the orphanage so that he could go and buy what food he can buy, bring back to the gate, drop it off without contact, and, um, and uh, bring food to them that way. Uh, but the problem is there's a tremendous shortage of food. And the food that can be obtained is twice as high as it was last year. And, uh, and so they are in a serious mess, uh, really. And, uh, to show the commitment uh, that Nicole has to this ministry. Um, she had a date that would be the last flight for anybody uh, leaving Haiti. Uh, uh, she knew it was going to be in two days and she left Port-au-Prince and uh, went to the orphanage instead of staying in Port-au-Prince and getting a plane out. So she is committed there. Uh, whatever that brings, whatever that means, whatever happens, she's put her life on the line to be there with those kids. Uh, so we need to pray for her, pray for the kids, pray for the other workers there, pray for the whole nation. Uh, because it's hard to imagine, but no one is admitting or wanting to let anyone know of their sickness if they are sick with the virus. 
simply because at least one we know, and no doubt others, if one we know of has, uh, one person, when, when they found out they had the virus, uh, people took machetes and cut them to pieces uh, instead of letting them live to spread the virus. So every medical facility, every hospital is closed. Uh, they have killed one of the doctors uh, that, uh, that we know about. And, um, and so people, instead of being able to get help and compassion and understanding in their sickness like people would be getting here, there, if it's known, uh, they'll die whether they die from the virus or not in, in probably most situations. So it's a horrible place. And, um, and Nicole is there and uh, she has the concern of trying to feed about 45 or 50 people uh, and, um, and that's getting harder each day. So please pray for them. Please pray that soon this thing will run its course uh, and that, that not only we but other nations in the world can be, get back to where we were before uh, this deadly thing came. Uh, so, uh, have a great rest of your Resurrection Sunday uh, from all of us here. Uh, God bless you. Uh, thank you for joining us.